afternoon, we're going to get started and let those who come in late uh, join us. Uh, I, uh, at the conclusion of any presentations, we welcome you ask questions even during them, so it's not so formal. But I would request that we, you wait until we get a microphone to you, because every week <clears throat> there are between two and 400 <clears throat> people at NIH who are watching this uh, live, and uh, they send me emails saying we heard the answer, but we don't know what the question was. So it makes it a, a little bit clearer. Uh, two or three days after all that, uh, these programs go out on the NIH video archive where they go around the world and they're replicated now in 18 countries and over two dozen major North American institutions. So there's quite an audience out there and uh, they'd like to hear your questions uh, uh, too. So uh, some of you, I think, haven't been here before. So I'll begin with a quiz. What is that? Wait a minute. You know. <laughs> what is it? Do you know? I can't hear you. Huh? Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, actually, that picture was taken by my grandfather, believe it or not. And uh, that's Manhattan on the other side in the 1860s. So, you know, we show this because the purpose of this course is to put us in the same position as these gentlemen who are on the catwalk. In fact, women used to pose on this thing with their billowing skirts and the wind blowing. It was a very fashionable thing to do. I think one or two of them actually got blown overboard, so they stopped. But uh, so the point is, we're trying to link uh, exciting advances and challenges in basic biological and physical sciences uh, with major health problems. And so the whole purpose of this course is to convert everybody into a bridge builder, an engineer, think out of your box. Uh, for those who have clinical experience, uh, the speakers provide sort of the state of art, the art of thinking as to what the basic problems are and what we really don't know and should know. And if you've had little or no clinical type of training or experience, uh, the intent is to give you a, a sense of why these diseases that are discussed are important. All of this is on the website, and you can download PowerPoints for the past 12 years, if you wish, that cover an enormous range of, of uh, materials. So, So today, uh, unfortunately, uh, Snorri Torgerson, uh, who's a senior scientist globally known for his work in this field, uh, is ill with the flu. And so I'm going to do a very uh, substitute a little bit, because uh, I don't think anybody can fully substitute for Snorri. But I'm going to take you through parts of the primary liver cell cancer story and problem, at the end of which we hope that you'll have a pretty clear idea as to why there's so much interest uh, involved in this and what the challenges are. So the upper panel there is what the normal liver looks like when it's stained with the traditional stain of hematoxylin and eosin. And I won't go into the anatomy, but you sort of get a gestalt that it's a pretty dull looking uh, collection of hepatocytes. It's not like the bone marrow. So these cells only divide about once a year. So you can spend years looking at normal liver in microscopic sections, and you rarely, if ever, see a mitotic figure. They're in G0. 
The thing in the middle is what it looks like when the liver loses its uh, symmetry and everything and becomes a mass of scar tissue and regenerative nodules and altered circulation, and that's cirrhosis. Uh, and there are many causes of cirrhosis. And cirrhosis is a factor, but it's not the only one in primary liver cancer. We'll get to that. And down at the bottom there is a histologic view uh, of what it looks like when it's abnormal uh, with inflammation, vasculature, and funny looking cells with mitotic figures. Now, now, why do I have to do this? Okay, so I want to say a word about this. It may be surprising to you, but not so many, many years ago, maybe to you it seems like many years, to me it seems like yesterday, but roughly in the 70s, that isn't too far back, uh, if you visited in the Orient, Japan, China, or Sub-Saharan Africa, primary liver cell cancer was the number one disease. The hospitals were filled of it. I remember visiting a hospital in Shanghai, about 90% of the people there had primary liver cancer. Nobody got too excited about it. I mean, unfortunately, the patients all died, but I mean, it wasn't unusual. But if there were a primary liver cancer patient that appeared in an American, North American hospital, that patient would be presented at grand rounds because our hospitals were filled with people dying of cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, which at that time was very rare in the Orient and Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is a dramatic business. So nobody paid too much attention in this country to primary liver cancer because it, you know, it was a rarity and there were so many other things to do. We were not deeply involved in global medicine in the 70s or in the 80s. But now it's the fifth most common cancer in the United States. And it's the second most lethal one worldwide. And it's increasing at a rate much greater than the rate of increase of any serious cancer. I mean, I'm excluding some of the sort of more manageable skin cancers and so forth. So this has become a huge problem and we'll show you a little bit more. So one interesting question is how did that happen? It's not all due to the fact <clears throat> that many people, boat people and others immigrated to the United States from the Orient, for example, that was an important uh, consideration and for a while, we saw patients with liver cancer. They were almost all oriental, and uh, they were in their 50s, so forth. And that was the picture, dramatically changed. That does exist now, but there are many other clinical phenotypes. So it's not just that individual that one looks for clinically for this disease. And <clears throat> why is it so lethal? Now, you all know where the liver is. Can you all put your finger on it? It's the size of a football. You're on the wrong side, sir. It's on the right, not the left. <laughs> so it's like a football under your right rib. Now, the interesting thing is it doesn't have any nerves of a sensory nature except on the capsule, which is one layer uh, that surrounds the liver. And the only pain you ever get from the liver is when something affects that capsule. So you got this biggest solid organ in the body, the size of a football, and a lot can go on there and you wouldn't have a clue. That's one of the factors that involves its lethality because the struggle is to diagnose it before there are any symptoms even. Because by the time there are symptoms, what it means usually is that the tumor has invaded something, the blood vessel, the bile ducts. It's done something, and it produces a whole variety of rather serious clinical problems. There may be bleeding, 
uh, there may be jaundice and all that. And by that time, you know, it's too late. So that's one of the reasons for the lethality. Now it's doubled in the United States over the past two decades. And uh, we'll show you one graph here uh, to indicate that the predictions are this is going to continue. I hope at this point you're thinking why. So we'll get to that, at least what we think we know is the why. Now the other interesting thing is that this cancer has a characteristic of being drug resistant. Now many cancers, particularly leukemias and so forth, they become drug resistant when people are given drugs. But the liver frequently is resistant even if nobody was treated with an anti-cancer drug. We don't fully understand that, except for the fact the liver is the main place where all the garbage of what we eat and what our bugs do in the intestine travels up through the portal vein and it's got to go through the liver. And you may recall that many of the anti-cancer drugs are natural products or derived from them. So they come from fruits and vegetables and we don't usually chew the bark of trees, but some people do. And, <laughs> and at any rate, the liver is set up to become drug resistant almost from scratch. And that's an enormous clinical problem in trying to devise chemotherapy to treat the liver. And so the treatment of choice uh, at the moment, at least the ones, people who survive, are ones who have surgery. Now, surgery. I already pointed out that if you have symptoms, you have problems because it usually means that it's pretty extensive. So it's not terribly surprising that most surgery, at least partial resection of the liver is ultimately not very successful, but we'll hear much more about this from Dr. Curtin. But generally speaking, less than 40% of people with cancer are even eligible for that kind of surgery because there are multiple metastases or it's in a very strategic place. And many patients now have total liver transplantation, which is somewhat more successful, particularly if it's found early, and that's the real problem. How do you find something early? We don't have a marker that actually says it. And the setup for doing diagnostic screening in people at risk, you know, it's expensive, it's not readily available, and it's not so overwhelming successful either. Relapse occurs in most patients after cancer because this tumor tends to spread along blood vessels for the most part. And there may be multiple sites within the liver, often maybe just a millimeter or, or less that are part of the spread. So there are things about the spread and the metastases that we don't understand either that are challenging. Yeah? If you say after surgery, um, then you are not referring to the I'm sorry, yeah, what? I think we'll hold that and let Tim comment because he's going to talk a bit about this. Um, should I, yeah. Is it on? I don't know. But just hold the question for just a little while because oh, okay. Tim is going to discuss this in more detail. So for all these reasons, uh, this is a major health problem. Now, th this is just a graph to show that the long-term mortality uh, trends uh, up at the top, liver and intrahepatic bile ducts, that leads the pack in terms of the percentage increase. There are more and more patients every year, a greater percentage. Uh, likewise, melanoma and pancreas and so forth, whereas the ones in blue, it doesn't mean that they are being cured but it means that various things have been done with all of them that tend to reduce the frequency, say, control of tobacco and its effect on lung cancer and so forth. 
So I just want to talk about this one a little bit here because I'm going to talk about the upper part of this. Tim is going to focus more on the lower part. So I told you about some clinical aspects that <clears throat> the tumor uh, may be small, may even get to be fairly big before it does anything. And the other thing you should know is that practically every function of the liver, which includes metabolism, detoxification, secretion, all that sort of stuff, is present with a huge functional reserve. Simply putting it, there's about at least 10 times as much functional reserve as we actually use. Now that means you have to destroy a lot of liver cell function in order to see that in some measurable metabolic way, let's say the serum, albumin, or coagulation proteins. So all of these things contribute to the clinical difficulty. Uh, we'll hear more about tumor staging and metastasis. Now, the setting for primary liver cancer, uh, more often than not, is on the basis of chronic liver disease usually cirrhosis, but not necessarily. Now, cirrhosis is a situation where liver cells have been damaged and they're stimulated to regenerate, but they're regenerating in an organ that has disrupted matrix and blood vessels and everything. So you get these nodules formed and they seem to be the setup for the development of cancer. We'll hear more about that. Now, <laughs> A little bit about demography. For the most part, these are patients, uh, tend to be more male than female, but these are people that are in their 50s, 60s, sometimes 40s. But there are some dramatic exceptions. So I'm going to tell you quickly a story of a dramatic exception. The gold mines in South Africa are from a mile to a mile and a half below the surface of the earth. They exist at multiple levels with like spokes going out. And in those spokes, people work lying on their backs with pneumatic hammers, drilling holes, because the gold there is not big chunks that you can just see, you know, and grab. They have to extract it from the ore. Way back, you could see it. If you've ever been to South Africa, the wit water strand means white water because somebody saw stuff glistening in the water. And that was actually the gold uh, area. But that area has dipped down now geologically. It's about a mile, mile and a half down. So these people, so to work down there, you have to be young and very strong and very well nourished. In fact, it's so hot down there, you have to take about 4,000 calories a day. Now, who does that? Well, in the days when I went there, these were young men from uh, Zimbabwe who were given a contract and they came to work. They were all in their teens, early 20s, extremely strong physical condition, perfectly healthy. 4,000 calories a day, and they were acclimatized to work under these conditions. Very hard, very difficult work, okay? And then a classic story was that a young man of about 20, maybe he is uh, washing or shaving one morning, and he feels something funny in his side. And he's dead within a matter of four to six weeks of primary cancer of the liver. And when many of those patients, it actually happened that, that fast. How could that be? Amongst that population, there was a, that was more common, believe it or not, than life-threatening accidents in some of those mines. So this was big time. Well, people looked to the environment. And in Zimbabwe, like in much of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there's aflatoxin, which is a fungal product present in grain and all, 
And so people, you know, eat this and so forth. And aflatoxin in animals is a very good way to make liver cancer. And there was actually a group here, Kurt Harris, who showed that there was site-specific phosphorylation on P53. And that was a flashpoint for indicating. Well, it turns out that was due to aflatoxin. But that wasn't the whole story. Because beginning in the 70s, hepatitis B virus was identified. And if you took the map of where these primary liver cancer was most common, you could superimpose where there were high carrier rates for hepatitis B virus, a double-stranded DNA virus discovered here at the NIH by Barry Blumberg and Harvey Alter, who spoke in the course earlier. Barry won the Nobel Prize for it. It was the first hepatitis virus ever really identified. And it turned out that people were carriers. And the miners were also carriers. Now, where did they get it from? 19, 20 years old. They got it from their mothers. So it was transmitted at birth. And they never were very sick from it. In fact, they were living, you know, they were, they were great. But they had it for 20 years. And the tumor developed. And they did not have cirrhosis. Some of them did. Most of them did. So that's one picture, OK, of, of what the environment was. So once hepatitis B was recognized and vaccination took place, this was the first cancer to ever be prevented by vaccination. In Taiwan, where the risk of primary liver cancer was 400 to 1, if you were, H, if you were hepatitis B positive, the risk of getting lung cancer if you smoke two packs of cigarettes a day is only about maybe 40 to 1. So the risk of liver cancer was 10 times greater if you were hepatitis B. But well, they instituted a Taiwan-wide vaccination program because the vaccine turned out to be the surface antigen, which is what originally was detected here at NIH, the so-called Australia antigen, turned out to be a potent vaccine. And it's the basis of the vaccines we have now. Now you know everybody should get, I hope you all, are vaccinated against hepatitis B. So once that happened in Taiwan, within a short period of time, four, five, six years, the frequency of primary liver cancer went like that. And it's very, very low, because I think virtually everyone is vaccinated. It's a disease that's disappeared. But it hasn't disappeared in many of the people who come to the United States from Cambodia, from Laos, even from Thailand and other places. So one of the reasons for the HCC, uh, HCC liver cancer development is that we still have a hepatitis B problem. The vaccine doesn't do anything if you're already infected and so forth. So those people are treated with drugs, which have ups and downs and are, are not as effective as the drugs which seem to, for example, eradicate hepatitis C. So the second thing of importance, if you took the hepatitis B global map, okay, it overlapped the liver cancer map. And so it was Blumberg and Milman and those people who said, gee, maybe these guys are related to one another. And that started the whole business of, of identifying hepatitis B as a major factor in the development of cancer. And it's the factor in the uh, Zimbabwe uh, miners. But now it's been replaced by hepatitis C. Uh, and most of the cases that are seen now in this country of oriental nature, the majority of them are hepatitis C patients. But as you know, uh, we have drugs which seem to eradicate hepatitis C. And I guess perhaps not fully known, documented, that 
they prevent the development of, of cancer. But it's interesting that liver cancer is the first cancer that was ever prevented by a vaccination and prevented by a, uh, a drug. Uh, well, then there were a lot of chemical carcinogens, various parasites, microbiota, and so forth and so on. And there were lifestyle factors that statistically, you know, have a risk that's connected with it, but I don't think anyone's shown that they are etiologically related. The alcohol is interesting, of course, because of its association with <laughs> chronic uh, liver disease. Uh, I, I don't know whether somebody who <clears throat> just drinks up on a weekend and gets smashed but doesn't have serious liver disease, I don't know whether they're at increasing risk. So then I just want to tell you one other story, which I think is relevant to all of this. And that is, you have to think out of the box. So the people who did the hepatitis B work were great thinkers out of the box, believe me. None of them were liver doctors, okay? Blumberg was a, uh, really, Barry was a rheumatologist and a, uh, an anthropologist. And Harvey was a hematologist in the blood bank. He's largely responsible for cleaning up the blood bank of all hepatitis uh, viruses, an amazing accomplishment. It used to be if you had a blood transfusion, the risk of getting hepatitis was very high, maybe up to 40%, depending on how many transfusions you had. So, where was I going? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, yes. <clears throat> so, think out of the box. So, the Blumberg people were sitting around in Fox Chase Cancer Center saying, how, where does hepatitis B come from? And this is a true story. Someone said, it's got to come from an animal or a vector. And somebody else said, where do we find animals? And another person said, in the zoo. So they went to the zoo in Philadelphia, and they got blood samples from every patient in the zoo hospital. And they measured DNA polymerase, because hepatitis B virus is a DNA virus that replicates by polymerization. And of all the animals there, one of them turned out to be positive and had a DNA polymerase in it, and that was a woodchuck. So they went ahead and they identified the virus in the woodchuck, which turns out to be a member of this family of hepatitis B. It's not the same. And there are several other animal viruses which are of the same family. And the story was that the molecular biologist who did this work, Irv Milman, uh, presented it. And a man in the back of the room said, where did you get the woodchucks? And he said, from the zoo. And he said, well, they're my woodchucks. I've been studying them for 10 years. And I've been studying them because they develop primary cancer of the liver. Now, it's interesting. The molecular virologist, <laughs> they didn't care about the woodchucks. And the woodchuck pathologist who was studying the cancer, he found out about this fortuitously because he heard their presentation. Well, the bottom line of the story is that you can infect woodchucks with the woodchuck hepatitis virus and they develop an acute inflammation, and then they develop liver cancer. The humans don't do that. This is not an, inf an acute inflammatory thing, either with hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or any of the toxins. So it's a whole different business. So now you're ready to think genomically, informatically, immunologically, What's going on that can cause these different uh, uh, sort of uh, phenotypes? And I'm going to skip that because Kim is going to talk about this. I would just point out that, and we'll get back to this in more detail, 
The point I've been trying to make, and it begins on the left over there, the normal liver can develop a tumor going up to the right, which doesn't have anything to do with underlying chronic liver disease. That's pretty rare, but it does happen. And more recently, the past, I think it's three or two and a half years ago now, uh, it was established that there's a form called fibrolamellar liver cancer, which is a liver cancer lethal of young, young people. And that turns out to be a mutation in a PKA. And the pathway for that was elegantly worked out and described. And I put it on the website. We could look it up. And hepatoblastoma, which is a different kind of a, a tumor, sort of a earlier form, uh, that also has some uh, molecular type uh, genomic studies that have been done indicated. Then you got the one in the middle, where there's a relationship to fibrosis, cirrhosis, fatty liver disease, chronic liver disease. And there, there's a whole raft of molecular abnormalities that have been found. And the problem is, what do you do with it? How do you fit it in? In animals, that may be one may be sufficient to produce a tumor under certain conditions, but what's going on in man? And then at the bottom is malignant transformation uh, occurs sometimes without, uh, actually there are benign tumors that, that happen, these adenomas. So it's transformation, but it's not like it is in the middle, which is as life-threatening, and there are the chances of recognition. So what I've tried to point out to you is something about the rather exciting history of this disease. And it is, and you're going to hear a great deal about it over the next several years, because there are huge efforts to try and solve some of the problems, which I would say are, how do you diagnose it? Is there any way of how do you survey a patient who has, say, even treated hepatitis C, but with liver disease. What do you do to find out? And if you do find out, what can you do about it? And all of this gets tied in, in the post-genomic era, where we're learning more and more about pathways and mechanisms, and that's targets for drugs. So that's where we are. That's where you are. And so we will learn a great deal. So we're, now we're gonna learn a great deal from from uh, Tim. So uh, Tim is a physician who received his degree in uh, Kiel, Germany, and he interned in Munich and then did a postdoc at Hopkins, uh, where he began to work in tumor immunology. And he returned to Germany where he finished training in medicine, medical oncology, gastroenterology. He became an associate professor and in February, of 2010, everybody was very happy when he came to the NIH and heads the medical oncology branch as, uh, of the GI malignancy section. He's the head of it and he's a tenured investigator. So we put up a bunch of Tim's publications, which you can browse, and now he's gonna solve all these problems that I have enumerated. <laughs> All right, so um, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge because I'm actually two people, I'm Snorri and myself. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to briefly mention a little bit about um, Snorri's work, which I definitely am not an expert with as much. Um, I'm going to skip parts of the introduction because you know you already heard about this. Um, data indicating that HEC is, is, is a major health problem. It's actually worldwide the second most common cause of cancer-related death. There's almost a million of um, new cases worldwide, approximately 35,000 cases, um, 
per year in the United States, and you have seen this data. Now, before we go to HPC and before we go to the research, what I'm going to do is I have to do something here. Is this, yeah. So before we, before we go to the um, HCC and, and, and the research, the first thing I would like to do is um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction about HCC from a clinical point of view and tell you actually why HCC is so different than any, anything else you've heard in medical oncology. So let's start with the HCC or start with the liver. Now, um, um, you already know now where you can find it in the body. The interesting thing for me is actually, you know, the liver organ is very different than many other organs, and that has significant impact also on the pathophysiology and the treatment. Now, for reasons which maybe one of you can uh, better understand than me or explain, the ancient Greeks, thousand years ago, knew already that the liver is the only internal organ that regenerates. Um, you know, this is what you can see here on this picture, um, where, the, where, where the eagle comes and, and picks on the liver, and the person doesn't die. And the eagle comes back the next day, and he picks on the liver again, and, and the liver regenerates. Now, I just don't understand how, how, it was under, how it was possible that so many years ago, people already knew that apparently the liver, and indeed it is the case, is the only organ that regenerates. So you may have heard that, you know, there's, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the transplantation, but just, you know, out of, you know, there's different ways of transplantations, and there's actually transplantations where mothers or fathers, for that matter, you know, give a piece of their liver to a, a newborn, which may have some um, genetic defect and, and that requires an immediate liver transplantation. And the amazing thing is, you know, you can do this because the liver regenerates. And it, you know, this is, is really the only organ. It's a typical inflammation-induced cancer, so we know um, about the pathophysiology from a clinical point of view with patients first developing hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, and then HCC. Now, the next thing which is very different from an anatomical point of view is um, there's actually two feeding vessels, which makes things a little bit more complicated, but also is important when we talk about treatment. Usually, we have an artery that feeds the organ and, and a vein that um, takes the blood away. Now in the liver, it's a little bit different because the majority of the blood supply into the liver actually comes through the portal vein, and only 20% of the blood supply comes through the hepatic artery, So, um, which is important once we talk about treatments and um, diagnostic procedures. It's a complex disease because it occurs in 80% of the cases in an underlying uh, um, diseased organ. So about 80% of the patients have already liver cirrhosis. So in other words, when we treat the organ or when we treat the tumor, we always have to keep in mind that we actually keep the organ intact and that the organ uh, dysfunction itself can cause many, many problems, as you can see here. So if we forget the cancer for a second, there is many things, portal hypertension, varices with, that, can be, that can bleed. There is hypermetabolism, there is something which is called the hepatorenal syndrome, ascites, encephalopathy. So there's, there's multiple clinical issues which we have to take care of in a patient with an underlying cirrhosis. That's important to remember because liver cirrhosis is actually an end-stage disease. You can see here the natural prognosis for patients with severe liver cirrhosis, and in this case we don't talk about cancer, and you can see on the, um, on, on, the, uh, on the picture the patients with it, what we call decompensated cirrhosis. These are patients which you can pretty much only help with a liver transplant. They have a very short um, survival or outcome, as you can see. And obviously, this is important to remember because if these patients develop a cancer, the cancer is actually pretty irrelevant because the underlying disease is actually the life-threatening event in these cases. And, you better don't start treating the cancer because you can just make the cirrhosis um, worse. Yes? What's, what's the prognosis of a compensated cirrhosis? So, so the compensated cirrhosis is actually, so the question was because there's no, uh, was, you know, what is the prognosis of the compensated cirrhosis? So you can see five years, uh, um, um, 120 months, which is basically five years, is 75%. 
that's why these patients are actually, you, you know, you can treat them um, with a few drugs to maintain um, the liver, but you know, they are easily treatable with, without many major issues. And you would definitely not transplant, for instance, these cases. But, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, these patients have a risk of developing an HDC. So this is a patient population that we would actually screen. And again, this is one of the main differences from many other tumors. We actually have a, uh, we can identify a patient population which are, who are at high risk of developing tumors. Depending on the underlying liver disease, there is a risk of between three to seven or 8% per year to develop an HCC. So obviously this is a prime patient population for screening and surveillance. Now, um, so we already, um, th this basically brings us already to the uh, risk factors and, 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 and to understand these risk factors. So you heard a little bit about the hepatitis B as, as one of the risk factors. And obviously I'm gonna show you some data about the vaccination. But the treatment of the hepatitis itself is actually relevant. What you can see on this study is, um, this is a study that was done in patients with um, hepatitis um, B. It's an Asian study. And mainly what you can see here is if you reduce the DNA viral load in the blood. So this is basically what you do if you treat a patient with hepatitis B. You can, you can check the blood and you can see how active is the disease. And one of the readouts is a viral load. If you reduce the viral load, which you can see on the left side, you reduce the cumulative incidence of HCC. The same thing is you can see on the right if you don't look actually at the, um, at the reduction of the viral load, but if you look at the transaminases, in this case AOT in this patient as a readout of inflammation in the liver, if you treat hepatitis, you can reduce um, the risk. Now alcohol, which is always a very interesting topic and it was already mentioned before. So it's unclear how the alcohol uh, um, really what the risk of the alcohol itself is. The problem that we have is that many people actually have some underlying or a second factor, as you can see on this slide. So you see social alcohol intake, in, intake which is uh, defined as no more than two alcoholic drinks daily or three to six um, on weekends. So it's not, as you mentioned, getting completely trashed on the weekend. It's actually um, a, a, a smaller number. That can be very significant for patients that have, for instance, a chronic hepatitis C, as you can see, or for instance, in those patients having underlying um, steatohepatitis NASH, as you can see on the right side. Diabetes is another risk factor. We know that patients that have underlying um, liver disease are more likely to develop HCC um, in, in the context of um, diabetes. And finally, um, the increasing health care or health problem in the, in the Western world, obesity. There is a very strong association between um, body mass index of greater than 35 and the risk of dying from a specific disease. And you can see again on this slide um, that liver cancer clearly um, sticks out. And I will tell you a little bit um, about this um, towards the end of um, the presentation. I think it's actually very easy to understand from a, a very, uh, uh, if you just understand, try to understand the mechanism. The liver, apart from what I've already told you, how it differs from many other organs, has, is also different because it's the, the, the only internal organ that stores fat. No other organ stores fat. You won't get a fatty lung. You won't get a fatty colon, you get fat tissue, but you don't get actually accumulation of fat. And that's obviously one of the risk fact, one of the reasons why the liver is so much um, at risk um, in the context of obesity. So um, just to summarize, so hepatitis B, C, alcohol, obviously there's some genetic um, conditions as well as uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, diabetes and obesity are risk factors for HCC. There are some calculations um, that this number is, is going up um, 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 in, the, in the next five to 10 years, um, which are shown here. Now, this is already mentioned. Obviously, the hepatitis B vaccine has been very, very successful. And here you can see it's been reported that in Taiwan, 
um, it was really, it's, it's really shown that this is the first vaccine that can actually be used to prevent tumor um, development. Now, I told you um, that patients with liver cirrhosis or underlying liver disease um, and, and compensated function have risk to develop an HCC. So that basically suggests that you should do, I mean, that you should do some type of a surveillance, some types of a screening to prevent or to early detect these um, tumors. From a scientific point of view, it's not that easy to prove that because you know, it's, 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 it, it actually requires quite a significant number of patients to do this. Now, there's one study, and I'm just gonna show this because I think it's interesting approach, and it has obviously some significant shortcomings, but I still gonna show this to you. So this is a study which um, uh, looked at the effect of um, biannual screening and in this case, it's basically um, an ultrasound and measuring of AFP in the, in the blood. And the study was conducted in China. So as you can see, they included um, patients with chronic hepatitis B infection and, um, at the age between 35, 59. They included 19,200 um, individuals. So it, it's a huge study. They were randomized to the screening group and um, the majority of the screening group agreed to participate, and you can see then they, 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 they were followed up and some of these patients developed, um, developed tumors. The problem is the other group, the control group of 9,400 individuals was not told that they were actually in the control group. So obviously this is not a study that would be approved by any IRB or that would be conducted here. Um, so that's obviously a, a big, big problem. But what you can see is that in that control group, actually, 54 patients died from HEC. So it's a pretty strong endpoint. And if we looked at this over time, you can clearly see that screening, and screening in this case is ultrasound and AFP determination every six months can reduce the risk of dying um, from an HCC. How do we diagnose the HCC? And here it becomes difficult, especially once we start talking about molecular um, diagnostics, et cetera. And I'm not gonna go into all these details that you see here on this um, um, diagram, but I want to tell you one thing which, and this is something which makes um, HCC again very different from other types of tumors. If you have a mass on ultrasound, in the liver, you can actually just by, and I'm gonna show you some pictures, just by doing um, um, dynamic imaging, MRI or CT scan, make the diagnosis of an HCC without even getting a biopsy. So you can see here, patient for instance, with a one to two, uh, one to two centimeter lesion, has two different imaging techniques. They are specific for an HCC. They have the radiologic hallmarks. Yes, and you can see you have the diagnosis of the HCC without a biopsy, which is a big problem for everybody that likes to do tissue research and likes to do genomic studies that we're gonna talk about because these patients actually never undergo biopsy. Now you could argue maybe we should do this and <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I think this is something that obviously um, would be very helpful. There's others that say they don't like to biopsy because there's a potential risk. One of the risks, just to show you here, is for instance, a needle tract metastasis. This is a patient that had undergone prior surgery. You can see within the, within the um, CT, um, there is uh, marked with a small um, arrow, a clip uh, indicating that this patient underwent a liver resection. And I guess before the resection, there was a um, biopsy taken, and you can see it with the larger, uh, at the larger error, there's a metastasis de that developed. I have to say, this is a very, very rare event, but you know, you cannot exclude this, yes. Is it a binding clip, biopsy yes. or core? So, fine needle so, biopsy or core. So obviously, it depends on who you ask. There is different techniques. You can use fine needles, you can use long, uh, you can co use cores. You can nowadays um, use different um, trocars so that you basically cover the needle. You can burn um, the, the, the track. So, you know, there's, there's a whole, whole story behind this. And, and I think the risk in theory, I mean, in, in reality right now is actually pretty, pretty low. But I just want to, you know, bring this up because obviously, you know, this is, is an issue. 
if you if if you come from a, a research point of view and you want to do all these studies and you think now I I get a patient population and, and they they all being biopsied and then you realize all of a sudden this is the only solid tumor where we start chemotherapies etc. Yeah. But we don't necessarily require um, a biopsy. Now the next thing is for those of you who know um, clinical um, oncology is you've probably heard about TNM classification. So you know when we classify tumors and, and put the patients in stages, it's always you know the size of the tumor, the number of lymph nodes, and then do they have metastasis or not. This doesn't help us in HCC. In HCC, the classification of tumor staging is very different because we actually have to take into account the liver function. I told you that some patients that may have just a very small tumor but have a very advanced liver function, they die from the liver function. And that basically has led to a variety of different HEC staging systems. I'm not going to show you all of this and what is, what, uh, how, how they all work. But what you can see is on the left side, they actually not only include the tumor burden, but they also include liver function, um, um, et cetera, which is, is, is very different and which makes it difficult to understand you know, how we treat patients um, from the outside. Now, um, this is a, um, a summary, basically, of the treatment guidelines as well as the staging. And I'm, I'm going to show you um, here, just to give you an overview of how we treat patients with, with HEC. On the left-hand side, you will see the patients approximately 30% that can undergo curative treatment. These patients actually have a very good five-year survival rate. I mean, you can see it's up to 70%, depending on, obviously, you know, how, how advanced the disease is. Whereas the patients on the right-hand side um, receive palliative treatment. These are patients with intermediate and advanced um, disease. Um, and obviously, depending on, on the disease, the outcome here is, is much worse. You can see that we um, do not only look at um, the number and size of tumors, but we also include liver function, which is defined by the child um, classification. If you were a little younger and you were a surgeon, you would be able to publish retrospective studies in the New England Journal, which is you know, obviously our prime journal. It doesn't work this way anymore. But in 1996, um, and this was still um, possible when, when uh, Matza Ferro, who is a surgeon in, in Milan, he actually reported the, uh, his, his, uh, uh, his, the outcome of patients um, that, he, um, that underwent um, transplantation at a single site in, in, in Milan, 48 patients. And he basically showed that if we transplant, and this is another point, which makes HEC very different from other types of cancer because usually we don't do solid organ transplants for cancer. And in this case, organ transplant is actually an option. But basically, he was able to show that um, um, you can do transplantation in these patients and that you have a very good outcome. He developed criteria to identify patients that would benefit from this treatment. And um, this is what we call um, the Milan criteria. Now, as you can imagine, there were other surgeons in other sites, and they were not very happy when they heard now everybody has to follow the Milan criteria. So here you can now see pretty much any other site that came up later. And depending on um, the site where the surgeons were working, they developed different criteria. And um, then there was somebody that actually looked at these um, different criteria over time. And basically what this slide shows you is that depending on your criteria, which are defined as how many nodules a patient may actually have that, you, uh, that undergoes transplantation or how large the tumors um, may be, you have a different outcome. Obviously, if you include patients that have more tumors or have larger tumors, they have a worse outcome um, after liver transplantation than if you're very restrictive and just include patients with small tumors or very few nodules, um, um, such as uh, uh, what Mazzaferro did in, in, um, in Milan. The other surgical option, if you don't do liver transplantation, is the resection. Now, there's obviously always a question, what is better, what is worse? And um, the, the big advantage, obviously, of the liver transplantation is that you, also res uh, that you also treat the underlying liver disease. You take basically out the organ that, is, uh, that has cirrhosis um, and can protect thereby the development of future um, HTC, whereas the other, option, where the other um, advantage of the surgical resection is that you don't need any lifetime immunosuppression. To make things a little bit more complicated, alternatively to surgery, you can also ask interventional radiologists to take some of their sophisticated devices, as you can see here, that they put um, under imaging um, um, guidance into the tumors. 
and then ablate or destroy these tumors. And it's, uh, there is um, indication that the outcome of those studies are actually very similar to surgery. So this is something that is individually discussed um, in, in patients. So the radioablation is actually... <laughs> the radioablation is actually performed with curative attempt? Or yes, palliative? so that's exactly the next slide. Oh. Um, so now I can show you, so the left, left, uh, the left part of, of this scheme basically shows you the different treatment options that we offer patients under with a curative event. So there's either the resection, there is a liver transplantation, or there is the ablation. And you can see here a typical example, a small single lesion in the liver. And um, then depending on, on multiple factors, you can decide um, which is the best treatment option for every individual patient. Now, if patients are, uh, if you can't do, um, if you cannot remove all the tumors because they're either too large or there's too many, and um, that's um, when we call these patients at an intermediate stage, and you can see um, the result here. So for instance, in this case, um, this patient has at least three lesions in the liver, which may be a little bit difficult to see on the left side, but on the right side, if you actually look at the arteriogram where the interventional radiologist puts a catheter into the hepatic artery, you can actually see again that these, that these tumors are highly vascularized. It looks like little tr dark trees um, that you can see. And that goes back to this initial picture that I showed you when I said that the liver actually gets most of its blood supply through the portal vein, whereas the tumors have a different um, architecture and they get there being supplied through the hepatic artery and we use this um, for the treatment because if we deploy the chemotherapy into the, into the hepatic artery, we can um, selectively kill um, those tumors. Yes? I'm looking at that image there and I'm seeing, I'm having difficulty visualizing how do you find the feeding artery and get to it in that situation? It looks like a big challenge for the taste. Oh, they, I mean, the interventional radiologists, you know, they find small, I mean, they, they find, for them, this is very easy to get with a small catheter into the different areas. And then finally, patients with advanced disease. So these are patients where you can do any of these um, sophisticated treatments. So these can patients be, for instance, patients with um, such as uh, lung metastasis as shown here. These are patients where we perform chemotherapy. And I'm just going to quickly um, 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 summarize here the data. So basically, on the left-hand side, the patients where we have curative treatment, um, different surgical options and ablation intermediate patients treated by the interventional radiologist, and then the sorafenib, which is a chemotherapy on the left, uh, on the right-hand side. And again, those patients that have advanced liver function, those are actually being treated with best supportive care, and we don't do any tumor-specific treatment. Sorry, how can you differentiate for with sorafenib in patients with advanced liver cancer? Okay, so that's coming here. Oh, okay. So, so that is basically um, the result from, from a study that was conducted um, that was published in 2008, um, where serafinib was um, tested in patients with HCC. This was an international large phase three study. Patients um, with histologically proven HCC were enrolled, and they had to have good liver function. They were randomized to receive placebo, or it was a double-blind placebo-controlled study, and they were randomized to receive either placebo or the serafinib. Study was conducted between 2005 and 2006. And um, you can see here that the, the trial conduct, so 600 patients were randomized, um, 299 received serafinib, 303 placebo. And then the, the results actually uh, were uh, so much in favor of serafinib that the study was opened um, already at an earlier time point as expected. So at the second interim analysis, um, they already noticed that patients actually did benefit. And now this is to answer your question. Um, so the, the outcome um, was an, an increase in the survival from 7.9 to 10.7 months, which is, is three months. And now, obviously, it's, it's up to everybody to decide, you know, how much of a progress it is. And this is basically where we're at. This is the only chemotherapy that we have um, for this type of a disease. And um, obviously, there is, is, um, is, is a huge um, unmet um, clinical need based on, on, on this data. The other point that I just want to briefly make before I start talking about the, the science is that obviously the uh, 
three point the the the, the, the time the the, in, the increase in survival is not the only thing. Obviously, this um, treatment is associated with significant toxicities. Hand foot skin reaction is something that we can see here. Um, some pictures um, on, on blisters that patients developed um, upon treatment, and then um, also um, other skin reactions here on this side. So obviously, there is 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 a, is is a huge um, unmet um, clinical need, and now the question is what do you want to do and how do you want to develop better treatments? So um, you've seen this picture, and, and I'm going to just briefly summarize um, what Snorri's group is doing and, and what their approach is basically. So obviously what they're doing is, is um, they're basically starting the tumor biology and the tumor genomics um, in, in, in HCC with two different aims. One aim is to really identify subgroups that may be at a higher risk or lower risk um, um, to develop tumors and then also that have a better or worse outcome so that, you know, we, we, um, that will, will, will help us um, identify these patients. And the second and obviously more important and more relevant question is, can we find uh, potential pathways or identify pathways that can be targeted using um, molecular targeted drugs to specifically treat patients um, with HCC? So um, you, you've seen this slide, which is basically just summarizing um, um, some of the pathogenesis of human liver cancer. Um, again, HCC is a little bit um, complicated because we see in a, we, we see a, um, regenerative nodules we see, in, in a, as I said already before, the patients have a, um, cirrhosis um, prior to developing um, tumors, and um, they will finally develop an HCC. And actually, there was a question earlier regarding the surgery or the transplantation and the risk of developing a recurrence. Things are actually more complicated in the res in the resection because if you resect a patient's tumor, the cirrhotic liver remains in the patient. So if you ask me whether the patient has, uh, it, if, if he relapses, the, the re chance of relapse is actually high in their first one to three years, but then the chance drops, but the risk of developing a de novo HCC is actually increasing. So there's actually two different risks that the patient has to deal with. It's not only the relapse of the primary tumor, but because you keep the underlying cirrhotic liver you actually still have the risk of developing de novo HCC at a later time point. Now, there is a different um, categories, and I'm not going to go into those details that we will um, focus um, for um, at this talk only on, on patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, we do know that there is a number of somatic mutations, as you can see here. Um, in HCC, it is definitely not one of the very high, uh, the highest ones, um, but we, we, we do find these and these mutations um, have been cat uh, further characterized. You can see here significant cancer driver genes. Cancer driver genes are basically those genes that we hope to find mutated and target because the idea is if these actually drive the tumor and we can block or inhibit these genes, we can potentially use them as a, as, as, as a treatment target. Now, again, this is not my major field of expertise, but what I can tell you, so apart from, obviously, you see here that P53 um, and, and TURT are, are, are um, a very frequent um, changes that you find both in hepatitis B-associated, HCV-associated, and you know, the different subgroups that have been um, studied here. The problem that um, the reason that, that we have noticed in the past um, years is that a patient, and I've shown you some of those pictures where patients actually have like three or four different lesions, that the different lesions are actually different in their genetic, um, um, in, in, in their genetic identity. So you may find mutations in one but not in the other tumor, and that makes a treatment with a specific target rather complicated because you may find P53 mutation in one lesion but not in another lesion. And if you have a good drug that would actually work, you may not end up with a good success because it only helps you treating one lesion or, um, but not um, the other. Now, um, um, 
uh, Snorri Thorgeisen lab really has been pioneering in, in understanding the, the, the biology, the development and, and, uh, of HCC, but also uh, identifying um, gene expression signatures. And this is just one of the slides where um, that basically summarizes data where you take um, samples from patients um, that have been diagnosed with HCC, you um, perform molecular analysis, you identify clusters, um, you have the clinical outcome of these um, patients, and you can identify thereby patients that actually have a better outcome or um, a worse outcome. And then you need to, once you have this data, you basically need to confirm this in the second population. As you can see here, the data is initially generated in, in Chinese patient and then was um, uh, also found to be true in, in, in the Western patient population. There is a, another signature here in primary liver cancer that predicts survival, as you can see, are using again, a gene expression um, analysis, and you can see a, a cluster was identified that helps you to identify patients um, with a better, better survival or um, recurrence. There's a number of activating oncogenic pathways. Obviously, these are the pathways that we want to target. Um, you see here EGFR, MYC, um, um, NF-kappa-B, which are um, all potential targets that we try to identify, or that have been identified and that are currently being um, discussed as, as potential pathways. And then maybe last but not least, um, to make this story a little bit more complicated in, in the liver, obviously there's also the idea of cancer stem cell and, and uh, his group has um, um, identified actually a stem-like um, phenotype, um, which is uh, um, found in HCCs and, and there's different, again, different subgroups. Um, which are characterized by a more aggressive growth or um, um, a more benign phenotype. The bottom line, the bottom line coming now from a clinical point of view is this. So I've shown you the data of the SHARP study, which was done in 2000, I believe 2005, 2006, published in 2008, and generated a big hype and hope that, you know, we would get advances in the field of HCC. But as it turned out, this was not the case. So there is a, um, in 2004, there was a, an outlook in Nature talking about liver cancer. And basically, one of the articles that was published there was just, uh, had the title, Try and Try Again. There have been many, many different studies in the first line, second line treatment, and they all actually turned out negative. They all had very good um, um, rationales, but the bottom line is that, you know, none of these studies really could sh um, um, show a benefit for patients. So that is one of the reasons why we believe that maybe alternative ways um, may be helpful. And that's why we believe that immunotherapy may be one option, uh, alternative way to go. I told you HEC is a typical inflammation-induced cancer. There is actually some reports about spontaneous immunity um, that uh, is observed. I don't want to say that this is something very frequent, but if you just look at the number of publications, it's actually the case that the disease with the most reports, which may be just because there's a lot of Asian reports about this, and, and that may be, the, may be one of the reasons. But I think there is some other reasons which are more relevant. Most of the immune-based approaches don't require a metabolism of the drug in the liver. So you can actually use this approach independent of, or also in patients with impaired liver function, which um, is, is something very attractive. And the other point is that these kind of treatments can potentially be combined with ablative therapies. I showed you the uh, pictures from the needles that the interventional radiologist puts into the tumors to destroy tumor tissue. I told you about the transarterial chemo immunization where you asked me you know, how the uh, interventional radiologist actually um, gets into the tumor, but as a side effect, and I'm going to show you some of this, this is actually having um, some um, significant immunological effects because you cause tumor cell death and you cause inflammation, and you can potentially, and this is what we're trying to do, is we can actually utilize this and then uh, use this approach to, to, to enhance immune responses. Now, immunotherapy is not new in the field of HCC. This is a study that um, summarized clinical trials that were published until 2006 in HCC, wherever you can see an orange little syringe on this picture that basically represents at least one clinical trial. The idea targeting the tumor cells, which are on the lower 
end of this picture using antibody uh, um, treatment, using lymphokine activated killer cells, cytokine therapy, vaccines, using peptides, dendritic cells, um, um, a lot of different approaches. The bottom line, unfortunately, until this point is that the studies were all negative. Total of 1,400 patients were treated without um, using the cytokines, other types of treatments without really any clinical responses. Now, one may say, okay, maybe you chose the wrong disease. HEC is, is, is or the liver, liver tumors are maybe not amenable to immunotherapy. Well, we actually found already pretty early in 2004 that patients with HEC develop spontaneous immune, anti-tumor immunity. So in this slide, basically what we show here is that in peripheral blood from patients with HCC, we can identify CD8 T cells, cytotoxic T cells that recognize tumors on the left side. And on the right side, we find, uh, we basically look at antibody responses again against, against an antigen that is expressed in tumors in patients that are um, treated with uh, either diagnosed, perhaps be diag newly diagnosed or then treated with different ways of um, um, ablation. And um, these antibody responses exist, obviously, there is no question that these immune um, uh, responses are not strong enough because otherwise the majority of patients would not progress and die from the disease. Why did they die? Why are these immune responses not strong enough? Well, one of the reasons is actually shown here. If we identify, if we, if we um, look at CD14 positive cells in the purple blood from patients with HCC and compare this to healthy controls, we identify the cell population uh, um, which is shown here on this flow cytometry analysis, which you can see down there um, marked with the red um, square, which is characterized by the um, CD, being CD14 positive and HLA-DR low or negative. Now, this cell population you don't find if you stay in peripheral blood from patients that are healthy or a number of other controls, as you can see here. This cell population is only increased in patients with HCC, and you can find them both in the peripheral blood as well um, in, as in the tumor. What do these cells do? Well, they are actually suppressor cells. They can suppress immune function. Um, in this, uh, on this slide, I'm, going to show, I'm just showing you briefly some data where we show that these um, cells, if you take them in culture, can suppress T cell function in, in, in very simple um, co-culture experiments. And they can also induce a different type of a suppressor cell, this, in this case, a FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells. The bottom line is, these cells are cells that we find, um, which are basically immature cells that are induced. Now here you can see the hematopoietic stem cell that would, under normal conditions, develop into these different um, branches. But in the presence of tumor and tumor-derived factors, um, such as GMCSF, GCSF, et cetera, they basically block the maturation of these myeloid cells. The cells remain immature. And then we can further, and don't wonder out of, I don't want to go into all those details, but the bottom line is these immature cells then can lead to immunosuppression. They can suppress CD8 effector function, CD4 cells, they can suppress B cells and K cells, et cetera. And that is one of the reasons why actually, the, uh, this is actually one of the uh, ways the, the, the tumors have found to counterattack um, anti-tumor immunity. And that is one of the reasons why the um, tumor-specific immune responses are not strong enough. Now, let me come to um, a more clinical point um, um, or approach that I already alluded to. So if we talk about immunotherapy, and the idea is to generate a T cell that can recognize a tumor cell, in this case, an HCC, and you can see the, the T cell in the middle of the, uh, this picture in blue, there's different ways of getting these cells. And one way are vaccines, and I've shown you that this was done in the past and it was basically not very effective. But now there's a lot of data indicating that you can actually use ablative therapy. So basically treatments that interventional radiologists do to induce these cells and then combine this with other means such as checkpoint inhibitors to amplify the T cell function and then um, thereby priming anti-tumor immunity and, um, and killing um, tumor cells. So we are conducting currently a clinical study here in the clinical center, and this is a trial design, which I'm showing you here. We treat patients with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, anti-CTLA-4. Um, patients undergo um, tumor ablation to basically vaccinate the patient and um, develop um, an, an anti-tumor um, immunity. And you can see here 
um, we treat patients that um, uh, in the majority of cases have um, failed um, all standard on, of care. And I'm going to show you here now an example of one of the cases. Um, you can see marked in red a lesion that we follow in this patient. This is a 60-year-old male with hepatitis B and, and multiple lesions in his liver. And you can see mar um, in, in red uh, or marked with a red arrow the, the lesion, which over time um, got uh, much smaller after six months. The patient developed a very mild colitis, which um, uh, was the reason why we had to stop the treatment. But if you actually follow this patient over 14 months, you can see that the lesion still um, became um, reduced in size, indicating that in, in individual cases, this treatment actually may work. When you use the immunotherapy in patients that have evidence of replication of HBV, for instance, yes. and you enhance the immune response, mm -hmm. did you see any kind of increase in liver necrosis that may be even worse for the patients, or you didn't see this kind of... Uh, I'm going to show you some of the data. Ah, you have. Okay. So I'm just going to show you a second case, and, 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 and we, we, we get... Uh, there's not going to be that many more slides. I'm going to show you here another case where you can see that um, over six months, a reduction in, in pretty much in half and in, in parallel, a reduction of the alpha fetoprotein. If we look at the patients over time, obviously, you know, it's not that all the patients responded, but we find a response rate. Um, where, and, and again, here we look at the lesions um, only um, at those lesions which have not been touched by the interventional radi radiologist. You can see that um, approximately... 30% um, of the patients um, responded and showed actually um, responses that lasted at least three um, to six months. Here is, is a summary of, of the data. Again, obviously, this is very early, but a response rate, as I said, of, of 29%. The treatment was pretty well tolerated, um, especially if you compare it with the targeted therapy such as sorafenib. Um, so there was not, uh, we didn't really find any adverse events um, related to viral infection. The majority of the adverse events are really autoimmune mediated effects, a lot of skin reactions, and um, some patients developed um, thyroiditis. We performed a very thorough immune monitoring to study immune cells in the peripheral blood. You can see here a, a huge list of different markers that we tested. And I'm just going to show you a very um, few slides indicating that um, in the responders, we see an activation of T cells that we can identify using different markers um, um, on CD8 cells. We can find um, antigen-specific T cells um, in the peripheral blood of these patients. And again, while the number of antigen-specific cells doesn't change, the, the antigen-specific cells um, become more activated over time. And then finally, we also had some biopsies from these patients. And um, here we can look at before and after, and you can see that um, a number of CD3, CD8 positive T cells actually um, infiltrated into the tumor upon treatment and um, did their job. Now, finally, in regard to the question that you had regarding the viral immunity, so what we did is we actually looked at the outcome of um, the hepatitis. Obviously, this is not the primary goal that we have, but these patients also happen to have viral hepatitis. And you can see on the left-hand side, you get a reduction in the viral load if you, look, if you see, look at the patients with chronic hepatitis C. And on the right, the patients with hepatitis B that were on active treatment, the same treatment that I had shown you um, earlier that is actually re also reducing the risk of HCC. So these patients were on active treatment. But even on the, and that's why we can't determine any more hepatitis B DNA. But we can quantify hepatitis B surface antigen, and you can see that um, also in the case of hepatitis B patients, there is a reduction over time. And the idea is that obviously you activate T cells and the T cells um, kill the infected cells, but this did not lead to any um, effects on, on, on the hepatocytes, side effects in, in, in terms of, of uh, liver failure or so. So um, let me just summarize um, this and, and come to the conclusion because I think um, we're almost at, at the end. So it's, it's what I have been able to show you that, um, you know, there is tumor specific T cells that, that you need in, in the context um, of this disease. Um, you can activi activate them using checkpoint inhibitors. Um, I haven't shown you the data, but there is data indicating that ablative therapies can actually induce these T cell responses. I've shown you some data that um, obviously this is not um, the end yet because I kind of ignored the extrinsic, extrinsic factors. I've shown you some data that we have that myeloid cells 
can suppress immune responses, but they are obviously also present in the tumor, so we may have to target them at one point. And then finally, I've shown you some data on the migration into the tumor. And before I conclude, I need to show you the people who have actually done all this work. So the clinical trial um, team is, 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 is a collaboration in the clinical center I, um, with Dr. Duffy, who is a staff clinician working with me, and research nurses, fellows, et cetera. It's a collaboration with the Center for Interventional Radiology with, uh, led by Brad Wood. The Laboratory of Pathology obviously helped us with the analysis of the um, biopsies. We have support from biostatistics. And then there's a research lab compartment uh, involved. I haven't really shown you anything about our basic um, mouse studies that we con um, that we are doing, but I've shown you some of the uh, correlative studies um, that we have done, um, where we study immune cells in patients with HCC. Thank you. Yeah. 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 yeah thanks. So regarding the immunotherapy, which kind of inclusion criteria did you use to treat these patients with anti-PD-1 or anti-CTL4? I would say the standard inclusion criteria that we use for any other HCC patient. Yeah, we, in terms of uh, how many nodules uh, and especially the liver function test. So, yes, yeah, so, that's, so there's, there's no limitation on the nodules. Um, yes, patients have to have a preserved liver function because I explain, try to explain to you that we cannot, we make it, that we, you know, we, we can't treat the underlying cirrhosis. If they die from the cirrhosis, you know, that's not going to get better if, if we perform immunotherapy in those patients. Yeah. So are patients uh, without cirrhosis? Yes, ah, that's so fine. If patient, they don't have cirrhosis, that's even better. Yeah, that's, yeah because usually you have 80% of... Uh, HCC with uh, an underlying we also had patients with cirrhosis. So I, I wonder how many patients the immunotherapy can be good for HCC. So let me ask a question. You're using alpha feta protein yes. as the marker here, as an as I've got one, as an oncofetal uh, yes. protein, and so uh, how good a marker is that of HCC in a patient who has existing liver disease, cirrhosis, and okay. regeneration sure. and all. So um, it's the best marker we have, and it has certain limitations. AFP, you, get, you find an increase of AFP in the regenerating liver. So if, if, you have a, if you treat a patient or if you follow a patient with chronic hepatitis, and um, you, you may see increasing in um, numbers of, of AFP over time if they regenerate to a certain time, to a certain uh, uh, event. If you have a patient with acute liver failure and they have to regenerate, they will get increased AFP. So those are um, problems. Obviously, there's a gray zone after, if, if the value is higher than two to 400, you know, we call this um, um, a very high and, and significant level. But the problem on the other side is that only 40 to 45 percent of all HCC cases are actually AFP positive. So there's a number of patients that never develop um, increased AFP levels in their serum. So I would point out that uh, Snorri Thorgerson was kind enough to send his PowerPoints, which are all on the website. And they're really pretty self-explanatory uh, for those who are interested in looking at the uh, specifics of some of the items that uh, uh, Tim summarized. Uh, they're really um, efforts to try and predict uh, which are uh, high susceptibility, not so much susceptibility, but survival patterns. And they tend to point towards certain pathways, and that's where the action right. is at the moment to identify and study those pathways. So there are pathways that deal with uh, cell replication, uh, <clears throat> with uh, apoptotic pathways, uh, mTOR with bioenergetic, so the huge amount of, of data which are then analyzed and point in certain directions 
for further study. And that's pretty much where the field is right now, right? Yes, that's good. Okay. Well, listen, I want to thank you very, thank very you. much for double duty. <laughs>